Chris, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to IconX Talks. And uh, so really the purpose of IconX Talks is to really connect the world and the universe, to really promote uh, the science uh, and also scientists, and also connect the world through science. So really science has no national boundaries, and this allows us to be able to really bring the people together. It's really an exciting uh, development, and uh, so then Really, we've got these talks on every Friday. And then also, in addition to our major speaker, and we also have got challenges to really promote the young scientists. And then we have featured about four of these young scientists in March, and then we have got an exciting young scientist today uh, in Dr. Bing Hao Wong, and then I'll come back to that one later. So really, my name is Jagadish, and uh, so I'm the Distinguished Professor of Physics at the Australian National University and I'll be hosting uh, today's Iconex talk. So it's an absolute pleasure and honor for me to really introduce my dear friend and a distinguished colleague and Professor Rodney Roof from Wilson National Institute of Tech, Science and Technology. Professor Roof has uh, done his PhD from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in chemical physics in 1988, and then gone off to Germany, and then he has done his uh, Fulbright Scholar. He was there in Max Planck Institute for Fluid Dynamics, and then uh, came to IBM, and then where he was a postdoctoral fellow, and then he has worked as a scientist at the SRI International in Stanford, and then moved to Northwestern University, where he was a chair professor for seven years, and then moved to UT Austin uh, as another chair professorship for another seven years, and then in 2014, he has moved to uh, UNIS, and then really he is currently serving as a director of the Center for Multidimensional Carbon Materials. And uh, so this is really a very prestigious uh, center. And uh, so really, he's really an outstanding scientist. And then uh, so he has won uh, some of the best awards uh, from various parts of the world, including uh, Material Research Society. And uh, so really he's going to tell us about uh, carbon and uh, then its developments in carbon, uh, multidimensional carbon materials or so. So please join me, we warmly welcome uh, our distinguished speaker today, Professor Rodney Ruoff. Please, Rod. Okay. You. Yeah, thank you very much, Jagdish. So I'll go ahead and uh, uh, share my screen. <clears throat> okay, let me go back to the beginning. Go. And okay, well, it's a tremendous pleasure to participate in this exciting series of talks, the ICANN X. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to be able to talk to you a little bit about carbon and related materials. And I appreciate very much our hosts for inviting me to this uh, exciting event. So uh, as Jagdish mentioned, uh, I'm at the Center for Multidimensional Carbon Materials, which is an Institute of Basic Sciences Center at UNIST in Ulsan, Korea. And so I'd like to give a brief outline. Uh, you'll see that I'm going to briefly introduce UNIST and the IBS, <clears throat> given that they're both relatively new. Uh, and then I'll, I'll actually uh, step through some slides about carbon out off of uh, Earth in the universe. And uh, I won't have too much to say about each slide. My students and postdoctoral fellows kindly put these slides together, and I thought it might interest our audience. And so uh, after showing those, uh, and of course, as people watch those, they can later watch the video and slow down and, and go into great detail on each of those slides. I'll then get into discussing some of the research that we've done uh, in our center uh, in uh, UNIST. And so I'd like to focus on the recent years uh, and look forward to telling you about these sorts of topics that you see listed. I don't think we'll have time, but if we are a little early, I'll step into some of these other topics that you see at the bottom as well. <clears throat> now, uh, UNIST, uh, also National Institute of Science and Technology, we are the uh, another IST university. So there are also KAIST, uh, GIST, 
and Bijist and now Yinist and Ulsan. And so our focus is science and technology, and we are a federal university in Korea that is located about right here, off in the countryside, a little bit below the central city of Ulsan. And then the Institute for Basic Science uh, was actually formed up at about the same time as UNIST. UNIST is just entering its 11th year. And uh, this is another uh, picture overhead that shows our, our lake on campus. Now, in the IBS, uh, we have centers that are, as you see, categorized in math, physics, and, and chemistry, and life sciences, uh, earth science, and uh, interdisciplinary topics. I'd like to note for you that we have three centers at UNIST. One is Center for Soft and Living Matter, and then the Center for Genomic Integrity and CMCM. So these centers are uh, spread throughout uh, Korea in different uh, universities and also in the city Daejeon, where the IBS headquarters is located. <clears throat> in our center, we have uh, several group leaders who are doing very exciting research with their teams. And this is Professor Feng Ding, distinguished professor at UNIST and group leader in our center. And uh, let's see, Feng's got a movie here that I'll start while I'm describing him. He's a really uh, wonderful theoretician who uh, has a strong focus in uh, computational material science. His background uh, uh, in, for PhD was in condensed matter physics. And so Feng and his team are really expert at modeling why these materials grow, how they grow, the kinetics and thermodynamics of these systems. And this is a picture of Feng with his research group and uh, some of the different commercial software packages and uh, self-developed software packages. So that's a very active area of uh, research in his group as well. And this is uh, another group leader, Professor Zhang Hun Li. He leads the characterization group in our center. Uh, this particular example is of uh, double spiral hexagonal boron nitride that you see here. So there was a beautiful in situ TEM study of the detailed structure and how this type of hexagonal boron nitride can grow. And this is a picture of uh, group leader, uh, Professor Zheng Hun Li uh, and his team. So uh, I should also mention Zheng Hun has a uh, sort of guides uh, aberration corrected TEM on our on our campus. So <clears throat> now, as promised, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about carbon in the universe. And as mentioned, I'll go through these slides rather quickly, but people can delve into them uh, on the YouTube or the, the the video as it appears later. So it's quite exciting that it's been uh, perceived that diamond could be present actually a major constituent in a planet uh, and also it can rain apparently uh, diamond uh, as a consequence of high pressure and temperature conditions it can convert carbon soot into diamond as it falls then we have uh, examples of uh, spectroscopy indicating that we have graphite in our solar system such as in Ceres, the dwarf planet, and Charon, the moon of Pluto. A little bit more on the diamond planet, uh, and this is you know, some speculation about why diamonds would be there in terms of the pressure and how the constituents could be converted into diamond. It's also been proven that carbon-60, the remarkable fullerene molecule that you see here, like the buckyball molecule, has been definitely found in terms of spectroscopic uh, methods in interstellar clouds. And uh, also 
rather interesting that it's been able to be uh, demonstrated from the spectroscopy that there's a distribution of monoanion, monocation, and neutral molecules as well. And there's been discussion of graphene itself uh, in space, or small fragments of graphene, such as as is presented here. And uh, this is an ongoing area of research to try to pinpoint whether it can be detected through spectroscopy, for example. I wanted to come to planet Earth and briefly mention, you know, some exciting things beneath us as well as well above us in outer space. So there's the famous Cullinan diamond. It's the largest uh, gem quality rough diamond. It's just enormous. Uh, this is its mass, almost a kilogram. And lately it's uh, been learned by scientists that such diamonds not only provide beautiful gemstones, but have remarkably important contributions to tell us about the geochemistry happening beneath us billions of years ago. So all of the diamond rings that are natural diamond uh, and necklaces and et cetera, they are actually billions of years old. They work their way up to the surface of the earth. So for example, uh, these sorts of diamonds uh, actually come from the deep mantle beneath us, and they can find their way to the surface through what are called pipes. And this is an example of uh, how when scientists look at these, and sometimes they actually visit museums and look at gemstones, for example, that are on display, they have permission to delve into some of what's inside those diamonds. And they found uh, the high pressure form of ice, ice seven, as small inclusions inside the diamond and preserved in that form. And you know, where do we find graphite? We find it uh, in various sorts of uh, deposits where it can be mined. So that's a pretty large uh, worldwide production of this material. And I thought the audience might find interesting the work, for example, by Aitchison on making synthetic graphite and how that was done in sort of massive scale. So he ended up getting not only graphite, but also very high quality silicon dioxide through his process. And this is a little bit more on that. And here uh, is I sort of jokingly say my periodic table. It's not, of course, the case. We have lots of other elements in our center that we study, but just for fun. So let me now walk through a couple of research uh, topics from our center, uh, and particularly I'll focus on work from my group. And I wanted to briefly mention some work that we've done with liquid metal, like gallium and non-metallic, particularly carbon fillers. And this work was recently published in Science Advances. And so gallium is a fascinating material onto itself. It has a very low melting point. Actually, diamond, uh, excuse me, gallium, because of its uh, uh, ability to supercool readily, can often be a liquid at room temperature. So it can be surviving as a liquid even to room temperature and a little bit below. Also, it's possible to alloy it with many metals, but particularly here, indium or tin, or both indium and tin, to make eutectics that have melting points below room temperature. So with gallium itself and with its eutectics, it's a, a fascinating material to work with. And there's been some surge in interest lately uh, in terms of use in flexible electronics and in other areas. So I'd like to mention our uh, work uh, in which we were able to make a putty-like, sort of plasticine-like material. And so uh, in our work, we were uh, following on uh, an accidental discovery where we learned that graphene oxide would be wetted by the gallium. This was somewhat surprising because it's known that gallium does not wet diamond. 
and does not wet graphite and uh, it does what not really wet uh, a lot of different carbon materials so we were curious and I challenged team members such as Dr. Chun Hui Wang to see whether he could mix the materials and try to make interesting composites and at first Chun Hui worked by hand in air in lab environment then we went to a mechanical stir or as you can see here an oscillating ball mill and once we uh, worked uh, with the material by mixing in air, we could find that we could make a putty-like material. And this is showing a little video that shows manipulation of this putty with graphene oxide present in the gallium. So there's some benefits to this. It's possible to shape these composites into virtually any shape. Another fascinating thing about gallium is gallium is something like water. So uh, the solid gallium is actually higher volume, lower density than the liquid. And as a result, when gallium solidifies, which of course, if it's super cooled, could happen uh, near room temperature, the expansion can cause problems in certain applications. But uh, we did learn that our putties actually don't have any volume expansion upon solidification. So we say minimal, we can say pretty much zero. Another interesting aspect is that, as I mentioned, gallium can amalgamate with certain metals. And then it also tends to leave this kind of stain on glass and other materials. And I'll come to that in a moment as to why that happens. But the putty-like material doesn't do that. So in the cross section, we can actually identify the presence of graphene oxide or stacked graphene oxide sheets in this composite. And uh, you're looking at cross section scanning electron microscope images. And uh, another thing that Chun Hui did that I thought was quite clever, we heated the gallium with graphene oxide or graphite oxide present inside it now, some of the audience might be aware that graphene oxide and also stacks of graphene oxide or uh, graphite oxide contain water uh, adhered to their surfaces. And so when we heat those, it typically evolve water, <clears throat> as is shown in this thermal gravimetric analysis mass spectroscopy trace, and carbon monoxide and CO2. And... Uh, so a little bit of chemistry is also happening, not only releasing the adsorbed water, and that leads to these large cavities being present. So we see a tremendous expansion, for example, during heating. But then the graphene oxide is reduced or deoxygenated, and consequently it can be, uh, shouldn't we learned, he can take this material and knead it press it again and make a putty over. So although this material is brittle and has these large cavities, by working it some more, you can convert it back to a putty, but now you have reduced graphene oxide rather than graphene oxide. You have what we could call graphene in essence and in dispersed inside of the liquid metal if it were, were liquefied again. So, uh, we were able to show in our work that uh, this had particularly effective EMI shielding, and I'll come to thermal properties as well, which were very, very promising. So it can be readily spread on paper. It could be put onto, as a thin layer, onto a film composed of stacked and overlapped RGO sheets, and the EMI shielding was, was very effective over this range from eight to 12 gigahertz, for example. Now, uh, we had the idea of mixing in some other particles in addition to graphene oxide and then the RGO. So we, we tried silicon carbide and diamond and graphite particles themselves. And it was during this study that we could come to understand that the size of the particles plays a role. And the reason why this mixing happens at all is because of this thin gallium oxide skin that's only uh, maybe one to two nanometers thick, G 
GA203. And others have studied uh, this uh, thin oxide layer and the role it, it, it plays in, in wetting surfaces and leaving a residue, for example. And we could think a little bit like this is like a balloon full of water and the balloon part uh, is the gallium oxide containing the liquid gallium. So in one of our tests, since our hypothesis was that it was the gallium oxide skin as very thin layers that was coating our particles, which otherwise diamond graphite would not be wetted by gallium itself. And that was allowing us to mix those particles in to make these composites. And indeed, when we tried making these composites in a glove box, we could not succeed. So that was another evidence that the gallium oxide is very important. We since have overcome this issue shown here, and we'll be describing that in a future paper, but at least at the time of the work, we could not mix particles smaller than a certain threshold size. And we ascribed this to the ability, so to speak, of gallium oxide skin to coat larger particles, but if the surface is too rough, they can't really get there to the smaller particles. And so, uh, as you can see here, the smaller particles were non-mixable and larger ones were for diamond and uh, all the larger ones as well. And these nice cross-section images show diamond particles dispersed inside the gallium. Uh, and so this is simply showing that we can identify the presence of this thin gallium oxide layer at the interface between diamond and uh, the, uh, the gallium matrix, for example. So we could learn that both RGO and diamond particles imbued the composite with a big jump in thermal conductivity. And the RGO was found to be more anisotropic. So as we would work it into different shapes, you know, it was tending to behave like a platelet and the diamond particles are more globular. So there was a, a significant jump in uh, thermal conductivity and thus the performance of this gallium putty material with diamond uh, for heat spreading was really quite impressive for thermal interface material. We have a colleague at UNIST, uh, Professor Lee, and he specializes with his group in a variety of different topics in, in thermal engineering. And so he uh, could uh, advise us and show us how to make measurements with uh, the proper configurations to really show industrial type of relevance for thermal interface material. So that was quite enjoyable. And I think one of the exciting things about working at UNIS is we have a lot of co colleagues with uh, great talent also in application space and, and in fundamental research as well. So uh, I won't delve too much on the particle size issue now that we know we can solve that, but I wanted to mention that uh, for the audience, maybe you'll be inspired. Uh, we happen to focus on liquid metals that are liquid at room temperature, but if we think of tin, lead, bismuth, and some other options, maybe aluminum, et cetera, there are some other options that are really not very high melting point materials that might find application where these particles or other types of particles could be mixed into them. So we think that there is a, is a really exciting large amount of research still to do in this sort of topical area. And uh, we'd like to thank the colleagues shown here as indicated and also all the co-authors now I'd like to uh, move on and I wanted to give the audience a sense of where is the world now and you know here in Korea there are uh, mass production efforts underway such as LG chemical and others on uh, CVD graphene which will be my focus but we also have efforts here and there are 
other places around the world as well on graphite oxide and dispersions of graphite at individual layer levels. Uh, my focus for the rest of the talk will be mostly on the CBD graphene and what we can do with it. So I wanted to show this is Professor Hafei Shi uh, in Chongqing. And by uh, undertaking a study of what happens on the inside surfaces versus these two outside surfaces, they could learn that stacking, uh, such as at their company in Chongqing, the copper foils uh, can allow in a, a, a sort of continuous process in which this is brought into a very large quartz tube furnace and the one preceding it is coated with graphene on both sides of all the copper foils. It's moved out into a holding area, pump purge the growth area, and then uh, you keep it hot and uh, then introduce uh, growth species like methane and hydrogen. And so millions of square meters of high quality CVD graphene on polycrystalline metal foils is, is now achieved around the world. And there's many exciting applications underway, uh, including for large screen uh, transparent conductive electrode, but also uh, particularly exciting application is probably every vehicle in the world in the future will have a graphene layer which will perform as an infrared sensor so that if you drive into a foggy area, uh, you'll still be able to see perfectly well, even if your eyes can't see anything off of the screen you're watching in your car. So let me now come to this issue, uh, which is quite fascinating of the fact that most metal foils are polycrystalline. In fact, I would say all metal foils you could buy up to perhaps about a year ago, if some companies have started up on the single crystal metal foils were in fact polycrystalline. They're also referred to as polygranular or many, many different grains. So this color coding here is showing you each one of these is actually a different crystal facet. So these are different grains and these are grain boundaries between the grains. <clears throat> so here's a wonderful poem that I wanted to read just the first stanza of uh, a Crystal's Lament by H.D. Block. He was a professor at Cornell University in a newly formed material science department and he was an expert in dislocations and the influence of grain boundaries and things like this. So H.D. Uh, Block said, uh, I am a little crystal in a polycrystal sea. There are many other crystals and they're pretty much like me. I don't have much to do with most except quite distantly, but some of us get together at the old grain boundary, at the old grain boundary, so it's a wonderful poem and I, I hope you enjoy reading the rest of it. But uh, when I sat down actually now six or seven years ago with uh, Dr. Sung Wan Jin and we read this poem together, I said, our challenge is we want to get rid of the grain boundaries, <laughs> Sung Wan, and make some large area single crystal foils. And ultimately we were successful in this with Young Wu working very closely with Sung Wan and we benefited from collaboration with colleague at Sun Gen Guan University, my friend Wan Zhang, who with In Young made electrical conductivity measurements at room temperature and low temperature of the single crystal versus polycrystal and copper foil. And our uh, theory colleagues did some very nice modeling about why the grain boundaries could be moved to lead to colossal grain growth by this contact-free annealing method. There's a very nice perspective on our article by uh, metallurgist uh, Anthony Rollett. So I'm sorry about the spelling here, that should be Carnegie Mellon. So briefly, uh, we could get a single crystal with the surface orientation of 111 as shown in these electron backscattered diffraction, EBSD images, and the in-plane orientation is also everywhere identical. So it's a true single crystal over a very large area. And 
importance to us is that copper 111 is lattice matched to some very important uh, carbon materials such as graphene, graphite, and diamond. So if we grow uh, on this single crystal uh, surface, we see if we arrest or stop the growth before we have a continuous film, interrupt the growth, the nucleation occurs and these islands will grow. And you can see by eye, they look very closely aligned. In fact, they are, they're epitaxial with the copper 111 surface. And as they grow, they will actually join together very perfectly. In contrast, when we grow, or, or others, on polycrystalline copper foil, you can end up with a lot of fascinating looking shapes and uh, sometimes quite irregular as shown here. And this is showing the different grains that are present by EBSD. I'm, I'm sorry, I should mention, this is low energy electron diffraction, a method of ascertaining whether the graphene that is coating the crystal is single crystal and also the underlying single crystal itself. We could achieve the similar sort of thing. Uh, copper seems to work a little bit better, but also achieve this with nickel and cobalt, obtaining the FCC 111 close packed or 0001 HCP close packed planes. And the EVSD patterns are again showing same out of plane and in plane. You can, however, see twinning, evidence of twinning, particularly with the cobalt. And uh, these foils are also quite important for us in some areas of research we have not yet published in. And then uh, it was possible uh, to also study uh, platinum and palladium. Now, in our published work uh, in that 2018 article, we needed to use joule heating so we ran an electric current and resistively heated, I squared R, uh, a central portion. So this is where the water-cooled electrodes were clamped. And you can see this is polycrystalline. And in this center, someone was able to obtain essentially a single crystal with some inclusions with a different orientation. I should mention that uh, it's very important, at least in our work, to be close to, but a little bit below the melting temperature of the metal in the foil. So for platinum, that's 1,770 degrees C or so. And uh, now we have an oven that we can hang platinum foils in, but as I mentioned at that time, we didn't. We borrowed our colleague's uh, oven that was a large ceramic oven and worked near 1,400 degrees for nickel and cobalt. And then we had a, a normal quartz tube oven for the copper to heat it to about 1080 degrees C. So uh, we then uh, needed to move toward making alloy foils. And I'll explain why, because we had some goals of being able to achieve making a material called diamine or single layer diamond. And then we were interested also in, in understanding the role nickel might play in graphene growth. So uh, Ming was my uh, first PhD student, actually in material science at UNIST, and he's gone on in his career. And so what we did here is uh, we took our copper foils and we electroplated nickel onto them. This is a very nice uh, way, it turns out, to make these alloy foils that uh, as we anneal and after electroplating, we were able to find out they do maintain large area single crystal structure. So that was something we, we simply had to do the experiments and find out. But importantly, every time a nickel two plus uh, ion arrives at the uh, copper and gets reduced, and plates out nickel, two electrons go through the external circuit. So measurement of the current can allow actually knowing the nickel concentration to three and maybe three and a half significant figures, which can be very valuable. Of course, we also weighed the copper foil beforehand and then uh, after uh, we would uh, check 
if the current integrated current uh, was sensible in terms of the weights and they were very, very close. So uh, after the electroplating on both sides, we heat treat, we anneal for about 10 hours, uh, again, close to the melting temperature of copper and we end up with single crystal, but now with nickel present. So why are we doing this? Well, I should mention that earlier back in the United States at the University of Texas at Austin, I had the idea of using commercial copper nickel alloy foils, which are polycrystalline. Now they're called copper nickel, but they have some other elements like magnesium present. And they're made in very, very large quantities. These foils are sold in you know, thousands of tons per year for different applications particularly in shipbuilding and in marine uh, ocean applications because the nickel and copper in that mixture, but also with the other elements like magnesium in small percentages are very robust against corrosion by salt water. So when you hear about 90-10 and 80-20 and 70-30 copper nickel foils, uh, they have more than copper and nickel in them but they're excellent for anti-corrosion. So indeed, in the earlier work, we found that the 7030, for example, that had a, a fairly high concentration of nickel could uh, lead to multi-layer graphene films. And this was some very nice, nice work in my group at UT Austin by uh, Shen Shen Chen and Yaping Wu and several different papers along with our colleagues and co-authors. And so if we use the 9010, then we might get mostly single layer and bilayer, but those were polycrystalline at the time. So having single crystal and having only copper and nickel and controlling the amount of nickel allows us to potentially make multi-layer graphene with fine control. And so I should explain, <clears throat> this is showing this work on uh, growth on uh, this sort of alloy foil with a moderate or small amount of nickel present. I should mention that the binary phase diagram of copper and carbon has a, a only small percentage at a thousand degrees Celsius of carbon dissolved in the copper, a few parts per million. But in contrast, uh, nickel has a much higher solubility of carbon in the nickel, uh, and that's going to be around one atomic percent at 1,000 degrees C. And so by mixing these elements with controlling the amount of nickel, it's possible to control the amount of carbon that will dissolve down into the substrate. And Ming was able to find out, along with help from the co-authors, that he could grow very, very fast because of the catalytic activity of nickel being higher than copper itself compared to pure copper very high quality graphene. And uh, these maps that you're seeing, where you have a lot of pixels here, uh, when you take the Raman spectrum, you can choose how to plot a map if you've obtained that spectrum at each different position in space, in, on the surface, excuse me. So this very uniform color with the exception of the black dots means very high quality graphene as do these sorts of Raman spectra here. Quite interesting, the black dots we can't do anything about. Those are due to cosmic rays hitting the detector. So you expect to see black dots. Otherwise something very strange has happened with the universe. So one very exciting thing about this was discovered when we did low energy electron diffraction. And uh, at that time, research professor, and now Hyun Sup is actually, excuse me, he's uh, at uh, just at this time, Guang, uh, in, in uh, Guangzhou. Uh, he was able to analyze the low energy electron diffraction and then by dialing down the incident energy of the uh, beam used in lead, we were able to prove that there is a particular beautiful superstructure and two different mirror image uh, types present of copper six, nickel one. And this superstructure is 
either present at the very top atomic layer or maybe two atoms deep. So by lowering the kinetic energy of the incident electron beam, it's possible to interrogate just the very surface and not deeper into the material. So this is really interesting. And I think that a lot more science is coming from these single crystal metal foils by mixing in other elements because we find this superstructure present when we are working at concentrations anywhere between 1.3 and about 9.8 atomic percent. We didn't exhaustively research that, but that superstructure forms with a relatively high percentage of nickel at the surface, even when the bulk nickel is at a much lower content. <clears throat> now, if we push the nickel concentration up higher, this disappears and we have a different situation. And this was uh, Ming's hard work in the lab and a parametric study. So making many, many, many samples to then anneal them, achieve the single crystal with di different nickel concentrations, finally getting to the point where over multi-centimeters, 95% uh, of the film could be bilayer graphene and almost all of that was AB stacked. And this AB stacking is very important in terms of this single layer diamond that I'm going to come to in a moment. Excuse me, I'll just take a glass of water here. <clears throat> and so colleagues shown here were very helpful in and all co-authors in paper we published on uh, making a very high percentage of AB bilayer or at a slightly higher nickel concentration, making maybe about 60% of the area covered with trilayer, which turned out to be IB, ABA stacked. The Raman maps again show the, the very high quality of this bilayer graphene. So let me now come to uh, this topic of single layer diamond, fluorinated single layer diamond, also referred to as F diamine. So team members here uh, work closely on this project and we have a little home built system. We put our AB stack bilayer graphene, it might still be on the copper nickel or sometimes we delaminated that and put that onto gold or nickel TEM grids. And uh, we then could mildly heat xenon difluoride. It's a solid at room temperature, but has a high vapor pressure. And then by controlling the temperature here, also quite moderate, maybe around 40 to 50 degrees Celsius and the exposure conditions, we could convert this AB stack bilayer graphene to this new material called diamine. So Pavel worked uh, very closely with Dr. Manav Saxena on part of this project. Manav then went on to professorship in, in India. So this is showing a, a paper from 2013 that actually has Eunice colleagues. He started this before I had arrived on campus. <clears throat> very nice calculations of uh, assumed epitaxial multilayer graphene films uh, that could be fluorinated or hydrogenated. And in the DFT calculations, it was seen that carbon metal bonding could develop. Now this concept of, for example, driving this interlayer bonding to end up with sp3 diamond-like bonding, uh, it was Leonid Chernozatansky and co-authors who actually did the first theory study and coined the word diamine. It sounds like diamond and alkane. So uh, I think it's a good name. It's what we like to use. Then a number of other names have been suggested in the interim. And so uh, we were very interested in uh, trying to achieve stoichiometry C2F. And the question is, if we achieve that stoichiometry, is it going to have the expected diamine structure, or might it be some other structure? And we could indeed prove that it has this structure here, and that involved a lot of good work in the laboratory and some very nice theoretical modeling as well. So let me uh, go right to 
uh, some beautiful images that were obtained by Sokwu in Professor Zheng Hun Li's group. And on the left side here, you're looking at the pristine AB stacked bilayer with uh, at any one point, you don't necessarily have exactly 3.35 angstroms separating the layers, but sort of averaged over you would. And then as we fluorinate, uh, we end up seeing very, very clear evidence in the cross-sectional TEM with the underlying copper nickel of the F diamine. We could indeed observe from the TEM either the 110 plane or the 100 plane. So the uh, interlayer separation between the corrugated carbon layers, because they're, they're kind of buckled up and down a little bit, is 2.06 angstroms on average. That's exactly the same interplanar spacing or interlayer spacing of planes in diamond. And the 1.62 is almost identical to the CF bond distance, for example, in CF4 molecule or in polytetrafluoroethylene. So uh, this beautiful cross-section imaging uh, tells the story, but there's a, another story behind this, which is intimately tied in with Pavel's X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy studies. So actually Pavel made a very judicious choice to use fluorine rather than hydrogen. Fluorine has an XPS signal. As we see here, I'm gonna to come to talking about the F1S part of the spectrum. And uh, here we're looking at C1S of just monolayer graphene in our instrument response function, but hydrogen does not have an X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy signal. It doesn't have enough uh, electrons, doesn't have any inner shell electrons. So uh, that's valuable that fluorine does. And then another very important thing is that the CH bond in the C1S spectrum uh, for different materials, like polyethylene, for example, is exactly on top of the CC bond. And so we would not be able to discriminate interlayer bonding if it's forming in diamine from hydrogenation, perhaps of the surfaces, but the CF bond is in a different peak position quite clearly than the interlayer CC bond would be. And so that was a very valuable choice. And uh, I won't have time to go into great detail about, let me just check my, my time overall here. Oh, we're doing pretty well. Um, I'll go into some detail, but let me tell the bigger story and uh, encourage reading our paper if this interests you in great detail. But here we're looking at the C1S part of the XPS spectrum. And Pavel looked at emission normal to the surface and then also at a 50 degree angle. Now at the 50 degree angle, you're sampling the, your you're addressing the sample, the thin film, in a different way. You're collecting from a thinner layer closer to the surface. And so at normal emission and at 50 degree emission, in the sample that actually later we could prove was C2F stoichiometry, they look quite similar, don't they? But in the samples that were under fluorinated, insufficiently fluorinated to reach C2F, they still have some, one can say, graphene-like character. Uh, there was a strong difference between the normal emission and the 50 degree emission angle. And here you notice the different energy. Uh, we're now in the F1S and we could do the same thing, emission normal and at 50 degree angle. And uh, this was again, very valuable because in this case uh, there was a not insignificant difference. And this was teaching us something about, again, sample A, which had stoichiometry C2F. So in this analysis, what we're showing is that if we look in the C1S spectral region and we assign the peaks properly, 
for sample A, we have very close to the C2F 33% that would be perhaps expected. But if we use this ratio of C1F to F1S, we also get a very, very nice uh, measure of the stoichiometry from XPS alone. And this again is telling us the same story that I just told you, that these two are underfluorinated relative to the saturated C2F, which is the diamine stoichiometry. So uh, this is a, a further analysis of looking at, you know, the tilt at zero and 50 degrees. And if you get a value very close to 1.00, that's again proving that you have very close to C2F1 stoichiometry. Again, showing the cross-section TEM, so I won't, I won't delve too deeply into this. I think it's very important to mention to our audience that we not only made the F-diamine on the metal film. So earlier I showed you a theoretical calculation that suggested the bottom graphene layer could chemically bond to the metal. But in our case, that didn't happen. The fluorine actually went down into the copper nickel. We have uh, a variety of different evidence of that. And so the film uh, had fluorine at the interface that converted the bottom layer to the fluorination CF bonding. But it was therefore important to remove the AB stacked bilayer and place it onto these gold or nickel grids, which can withstand exposure to xenon difluoride to fluorine. And uh, indeed, those studies also proved that we could make the C2F stoichiometry as shown by XPS and as found by TEM studies. So these beautiful TEM images here are showing if we have raw, those are filtered by Sukwu, and then filtered versus simulated, we have essentially perfect match with the expected structure for the F2 diamine. We also collected uh, eel spectra that were uh, fit, uh, I should not say fit, excuse me, that were separately calculated by uh, St. Q Quark's team, uh, and through the calculated spectra and comparison with the experimental spectra, it seemed like very well rationalized in terms of C2F structure. Now here's a very fun and interesting part of the story. It turns out that the reason why we had to have the AB stacking in the first place is we need the carbon atoms to be pretty much in the right places for the interlayer bonding to develop once we start fluorinating the top and bottom surfaces. So here we have evidence from Raman before we've exposed this sample to fluorine that uh, this portion here marked with the green cross is actually trilayer ABA graphene. So the Raman uh, analysis is sort of now a gold standard. And there is no doubt that this is ABA and it's not something like AB twisted or ABC. And this is region over here is, is again pretty much AB and there's a little tiny region that's single layer. So after exposure to the xenon difluoride, we had evidence that we had succeeded in making the F diamine here, but right here, we could not convert this layer to uh, this region, excuse me, uh, this ABA trilayer to a trilayer F diamine. And it would be expected that it could not convert because the third layer has to be C, ABC, rhombohedral, not ABA. And so indeed the ABA did not convert. We'd be very happy if we could generate large area trilayer ABC or four layer ABCA, but that's something still, uh, we are very quite interested in those sorts of samples. Another important uh, study was on photo emission and Pavel found a band gap of about 3.3 to 3.4 electron volts. We experimentally don't yet know whether this is an indirect or direct band gap material, but 
uh, St. Hugh Clock's group calculates it to be a direct band gap material. Uh, and another thing that I think that uh, audience could find to be very interesting is that if uh, Sakwu was focusing the TEM uh, beam a little more intensely on the fluorinated diamine regions, it could defluorinate and pop back up to be AB stacked. And that would mean it would be having a completely different band gap, very close to zero. And uh, so one can imagine the possibility if F diamine could be made in very large area in the future, uh, that it can be written with E beam and devices can be patterned with a nice band gap. And thus it's very appealing as paper from Zhang Fan Lu and colleagues has recently published, uh, they find in their calculations of the F diamine, a very high electron mobility. So electron mobility values can be up around 2,700 or near a thousand for electrons and holes. And so it really looks like, a, at least from calculations, but not yet from experimental measurements that we have potentially a new uh, candidate for uh, various sorts of devices in this F diamine. So I'd like to, uh, uh, let's see, 9.56, a pretty good timing. Uh, I'd like to sort of wrap up here and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, this is a photo so maybe a couple of years ago. Uh, we have Teacher's Day. I think this is a common thing in other countries in Asia and probably in Europe and the US and so on as well. So uh, some of our delightful team members and uh, without their hard work in the laboratory and of all the CMCM researchers, uh, we, we are where we are because everyone pulls together. We're a good team. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Jagdish? Yes, yes, yes. I have to unmute myself. That seems to be the famous word these days, right? So unmute yourself. And uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Senator, for a fascinating talk and the beautiful work, as always. And uh, so really, uh, really, you know, really new things which I haven't heard, in fact, in the previous talks which you have given. So really, I've learned a lot today. So typically in these meetings, and then we typically ask, uh, allow three or four questions, and let me go and then... Uh, share those questions with you so that uh, you'll be able to answer what actually with oxide or other materials in the composite. Ah, that's a good question. Yeah, I think that uh, also could be deserving of further study. We haven't seen any evidence of strong chemistry, for example, between the reduced graphene oxide or diamond or graphite particles, but it's not something we've investigated deeply. So we were focused on properties like thermal conductivity uh, and also the EMI shielding and understanding why these particles were mixing in in terms of this gallium oxide skin picture. Gallium oxide is a very stable material. It's uh, an ionic solid, a large band gap material with a melting temperature around 2,400 degrees C. So it might be a fairly robust interface between the pristine gallium or pure gallium and these particles. But it's an excellent question. We don't have a lot of studies yet of what might be happening in that interface, particularly over long periods of time. Okay, thank you very much. And the next question is from Regina from IBS. With many problems being solved in the recent decade, do you think that there is still some space for the research direction of CVD graphene? Will that be more related to the applications, please? Yes, I think that there's still a lot of room for exciting basic science. So it's, it's a very good question. You kind of wonder, all of us wonder, you know, are things sort of petering out in a certain field? And then sometimes fields go through a resurgence. And then all of a sudden it's exciting again. And actually we don't really understand as much as we should have. 
And so I think even at this stage, there's still uh, a lot of really exciting basic science to do. And you've mentioned, Regina, one example is the twisted uh, graphenes and their stacking. And this leads to a lot of really exciting physics, which is still being explored. But in addition, we're very interested in some properties that might seem a little more traditional, but it's still tremendously exciting, like the strength of macro scale samples is not what we were expecting uh, might be the case yet. So when you hear the uh, ultimate strength values of around 120 gigapascal, those have been measured on very, very small samples. And so we might have even expected that they would be defect free at the few micron scale. Uh, so one missing atom and atomic vacancy can drop the strength a little bit but we have strengths now around six GPA. It's still impressive. High strength steels are three GPA, but there's a big gap between six and 120. So if we could get to 10 in, by stacking high quality monolayer graphene or by growing very high quality multilayer graphene in large area, then the application space is really exciting. There are many, many interesting directions that can go. Those are just examples. So I think it's still quite wide open. So I think she has got a follow-up question on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Are the twist bilayer graphene with the same twist angle in the large extent by CVD method, do you think it is possible? Uh, it's possible. In other words, it's a good question because I'm sure uh, Jagdish and uh, the senior colleagues like myself appreciate when students are thinking about things or you know, younger colleagues, if it doesn't violate laws of physics and it doesn't seem to cross what we know about chemistry and how things combine chemically and so on, then it's possible. But whether someone can achieve it, that's another question. So I actually don't know how to do that. I don't know how to control uh, growth of the next layers so that they're at a desired twist angle. So I think it's tremendously exciting. Uh, some clever person probably will, will eventually do that. But at this time, I don't have any ideas about how to do that controllably. I think it's a really nice question. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. So the final question is from Ming from NTU. Would mm -hmm. A stacked and twisted bilayer graphene with a small twisted angle, say one degree, be fluorinated and transformed into sp3 bonded carbon materials? The answer is yes, they definitely would be. So if we could somehow configure uh, the layer stacking to be AA, which is nominally metastable, so it's right at the cusp of uh, transition between AB and AC, so, but it's possible to achieve AA by techniques like folding over small regions that's been observed in TEM. So without doubt, the calculations suggest that fluorination would drive interlayer bonding and we would have, uh, you know, the hexagonal uh, analog, like hexagonal diamond, sometimes referred to as lonstellite. We'd have that as a single layer rather than the analog of cubic diamond, which is what our team made. I think a twist angle, a small twist angle, like only a degree off, many of the atoms are close enough in the moray that they would be able to bond with each other. And uh, some sliding might happen uh, as a consequence of favoring that bond formation and favoring achieving perfect SP3 bonding that might eliminate the one degree misfit uh, or twist that we started with. So those is a really good question. So Professor Feng Ding, before arriving at our center, I think, I think, I think he published a paper uh, in which they had a certain level of twist. And so only a certain amount of interlayer bonding is occurring. In the other regions, it pops back out to looking like uh, three angstrom separation and then shrinks almost like it's been spot welded in certain spots. And that, so, so interlayer bonding doesn't depend on perfect AB stacking per calculations. So we have a lot more to do in the laboratory in terms of looking 
that the what sorts of uh, interlayer twist angles can still lead to interlaying bonding forming based on fluorination or hydrogenation on the open surfaces. Good. Okay. Thank you very much, Rod. And I think let's now move to the panel discussion. And then it's really mm -hmm. a pleasure and honor to have a wonderful panelist today. And uh, so, uh, and see, you can see those panelists sitting here. And then I'll introduce one by one. And Professor Elit Sang from Peking University. She is our host, in fact, and she is the founder of the Icon X Talks, and in fact, Icon program for the last 15 years or so. Uh, she is a world-renowned expert in the MEMS and nanotechnology field, and uh, she is really famous all over the world. And welcome, Alice, and it's great to have you on the panel. Thank and, you. Thank you, and uh, thank you for joining us. And so also we've got a special uh, colleague, and of course, Professor Paul Weiss, and he's also co-organizer of this Icon X Talks. And uh, in fact, Alice and uh, Paul have been organizing these talks for a long time and only recently have joined them. And Paul is again another famous scientist, and uh, most importantly, he is the classmate, high school classmate of uh, our speaker today. So then I will be learning a lot about uh, how how they both were in the uh, high school stage, and then probably we can ask them questions <laughs> about that side of things as well. And uh, so we we rarely have all three of us being participating in any of the talks, and considering mm -hmm. that Rod Roof is a good friend of all of us, and then we thought that all of us should join in the panel discussion today. And uh, so, of course, our uh, challenge and then the rising star and Dr. Bing Hao uh, Wong, and uh, he is a research uh, project scientist in uh, University of Tokyo currently. And then he did his bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Suzhou University. And then he has spent five years at Northwestern University and then now moved to University of Tokyo. Uh, he's really published some high impact uh, papers in variable electronics and flexible electronics in PNAS and uh, nature communications and science advances and advanced materials and the very high impact journals. And in the, he also uh, created a WeChat platform on wearable electronics and he's leading that one and then really great to have Dr. Wong with us. So with that, and uh, so now we'll move to the panel discussion and uh, really we generally give the opportunity for our challenger, Dr. Wong, to ask the first question. Please, Dr. Wong. Hi, hi, Rose. Ah, it's a very fantastic talk, uh, especially in the last part uh, you transform the graphene to the diamond. So now we have a uh, carbon materials from 0D to 3D structures like a diamond, the carbon nanotubes, graphene. So here's my first question. Do you think there will be another new famous member in the carbon family in the future? And do you have any idea what it will look like? Oh, that's a great question, uh, Bing Hao. Actually, there are essentially an infinite number of allotropes. So let's, let's get our definition correct. An allotrope is a, a single element form of a material that is identifiable as a, a new phase of the material. So diamond and graphite and fullerenes, for example, and particular type of carbon nanotube, those are all different allotropes of carbon. But yeah. because carbon is kind of really f fascinating uh, in its uh, ability to form different types of bonds. So carbon can be sp3 or tetravalent, or it can be sp2 nominally, or trivalent, or it can be sp. Silicon, but, you know, it's very unusual to trick silicon into bonding like sp2 it's very reactive and chemists then have achieved a unique form but it's it's not stable uh, so already with theoretical approaches our colleagues and Roald Hoffman contributed to this very early in the 1970s but many others now are showing through the computer modeling that there really is essentially an infinite number of them so you start to catalog all of these different potential allotropes and experimentalists can look at these numbers, namely the energy per atom, the average energy per atom above, let's say graphite and say, well, one EV, that be pretty unstable. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll go for that one right there. So I think that's very exciting. The conversation between the theoreticians and uh, the experimentalists and what can be made in the future. So I do think 
porous carbons like the Schwartz sites, uh, these porous carbons that have triply periodic minimal surfaces are very beautiful. Our group is actually doing some work on those now, so we hope to move that, that field forward. Uh, Professor Kiyotani in Japan and uh, recently Ryong Ryu's group in the IVS Center at KAIST uh, have done very beautiful templating with zeolites uh, to make those sorts of structures. And so that's, that's one way to do that. And Chao Mao at Hong Kong University has been building up bottom-up synthesis oh. you know, and building some new types of porous carbons uh, with negative curvature, for example. So then I think the classic materials like diamond and graphite can be revisited also in some exciting ways. We're, we're working on some things I can't... Uh, tell too much about what team members are doing because we haven't published yet. But I think that, that the, the story is not completely over on diamond synthesis and on graphite synthesis as well. Okay, yeah. okay sounds cool. Yeah, I'm expecting you <laughs> to add a uh, new carbon materials. Oh, yeah, <laughs> we want to do that. Yeah. And um, here's my mm. second question is, it has been Actually, seven years since you joined the IBS and uh, established the double CM. So that's a popular belief, seven years each in the marriage. So are you still <laughs> as passionate and as energetic as seven years ago? And uh, what are your expectations for the future of the double CM? Actually, maybe, maybe I can share my screen again and show you something else. Uh... Is that possible? Oh, okay. I'm not sure. Sure. Please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, sure. Please go oh. ahead. Oh, is it okay? It says this will stop the other screen sharing. Let me try. I have removed it. I have removed that one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, go back here. Here we go. I uh, think so. You know, uh, your your question is really fun, Bing. So I'll, I'll answer it in part <laughs> by showing a, a little discussion I just had with Bill. Uh, William, Bill Goddard at Caltech. So, you know, with uh, lengthening of lifespan, longevity, and so on, there's a lot of, I, I'm not so into that, but I, it, nonetheless, it's fascinating. We really can begin to ask questions like, why stop when you're having so much fun doing your science? And we have examples like extreme examples perhaps, but exciting examples like John Goodenough winning the Nobel Prize when he's 98 years old. So let me let me just show a little discussion with Bill. Oh, okay. Hey, hey, Bill, I just wanted to call and, you know, say happy 84th. That's pretty amazing. So how are things going lately? It's been, it seems it's like been really well, but, you know, along that line. It's uh, like you're busier I, than ever. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's uh, sometimes getting better, you know, it's getting better every year and there's more and more exciting areas. You know, I've been around for a while. We've worked in lots of areas. A lot of them are really, really moving forward. And so, uh, and I, you know, I have a smaller group than I used to have, but I have collaborators all over the world. So more or less, there's more projects than ever. So, um, so I think it's, um, uh, it's really great working with people. And you know, we had a, had a surprise birthday party, 7.30 Monday morning, which is my birthday. And uh, I hadn't expected it. It, it was supposed to be a, a call with a, a spin-off I started, you know, the, the CTO and CEO wanted to talk about the future. And then I get on board and there's 65 people there that have worked in my group. Some I hadn't seen for a decade, two decades. You know, it's, it's great doing science because you have these it seems like It yeah. seems like you're, yeah, you got people all over the world and it seems like you're also publishing more than ever. I mean, yeah, how, no, how, right. Oh. How long do you think you'll continue doing science? Well, you know, I, I certainly want to do at least another 16 years. Um, I think, you know, 100, <laughs> maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe I'll run down by then. I'm not sure. Um, so as long as the brain's strong, you know, I got a new right leg now. So I can, yeah. I can walk. Uh, yeah. So, so I think it's, uh, yeah, so it's. Well, we're, know, cer it's, we're certainly enjoying collaborating with you. So yeah. that's great. No, it's, it's great. I mean, I have. You know, two 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 calls a week to, to Russia, two different people in France, one in Italy, one in Germany. Um, those are all seven to nine in the morning, and then Asia usually is between four and six p.m. Uh, 
two in Korea, uh, one in China, two in China, one in Hong Kong, one in Taiwan. Uh, and this multiplies the efforts. I mean, so uh, often it's experimental people, I'd say a majority, but, you know, we've got people that can actually do experiments and things we've predicted. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, and then, the, you know, the, so, so besides the, the sort of new students and postdocs, you know, there's this people have interacted with over the years and collaborate, continue to collaborate on things. So yeah, it's, that's great. I think that, so as I said, it's, it's better every year. I mean, that what we're doing in electric catalysis is really, really exciting. We're getting numbers you know, right on with the best experiments. And then wow. the bio stuff, we've uh, figured out uh, how the G protein interacts with GPCR. So when you take morphine, say, uh, we figure out how it actually causes that sick people think signaling that it fixes your pain. Also, we figured out uh, how it, it interacts with beta restin to cause the side effects. And so yeah. I'm, I'm doing better science now than ever done. I'm not as good as I used to be at analytical, mm -hmm. but uh, I, you know I've got far better intuition and understand yeah. often what the answer is before we've done the calculations. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like now uh, the same for me. I just feel like. Uh, I hope I can do science until I'm 100. <laughs> You're a real inspiration for me. <laughs> uh, it's really a shame that a lot, of, a lot of my friends around the world have had to retire well before they may even reach their peak. I mean, it's, uh, and yeah. so it's really uh, that's a that's a pitiful, <laughs> a sort of a sad thing. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, so you have people that are at their prime, um, and and mm -hmm. and and they can't just keep doing the, the great science. And so that's, you know, we want in science, there's a lot of complicated things. We've got a lot of very important problems to solve with, you know, the environment, CO2, the change. And we need, to, we need to have the best people working on those. And so there's no reason that, that people stop. With. It's a great. We should have a bill. Yeah, we uh, should have invited a bill on the stage of ICAX. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a real model? Yeah, so, so coming back to things, questions are really a fun question. Um, it's not so easy, I'm sure Paul and Jagdish and Alice would, would, would explain, you know, there's a lot of people in our center who depend on me and it's not like I can just, oh, there's another opportunity, just go. You know, I, I'm very loyal to all our team members. So, no, I think we have a very nice thing going here on basic science. It's been tremendously exciting. You know, so uh, I think my answer is uh, lots of fun things coming in the future. I feel more passionate than ever about the science, and it's, it's more fun than it's ever been, and I think it's just going to get more and more fun as time goes on. So it's not like we ever get sort of worn out with it. Okay, yeah. Jagdish, yeah. may I please, ask a question? Alice, please go yes, ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I jump in, I'm really curious about, you know, Rod and Paul. You are classmates since junior, junior high, right? And uh, both of you are grow up to be scientists. What's the special magic in the class? So can you share with us, Paul and the Rod? Yeah, take turns. <laughs> Paul, Paul, Paul first. Okay, yeah. well, I think... You know, we should start by saying we're not the only ones. In this one math class, five of us became surface scientists of one sort or another, two Whoa. economics professors, two Greek scholars, and then another friend who uh, run first ran an Alzheimer's foundation and now another foundation. Even before, you know, social media, many of us were still in touch pretty regularly. And so Rod and I ran into each other on the board of a of a company, we were both on the scientific advisory board in a company and said, you know, oh my goodness, you know, we're, we're camping in the same field. Another one of our uh, classmates uh, showed up in the front row of the talk I gave at a meeting and we hadn't even realized, you know, the other one did, did something similar. And uh, part of the reason I think in that high school was there's only one high school in town and there was one university and one college. So many of our parents were faculty, and mm -hmm. even the ones who weren't were kind of, uh, you know, in that atmosphere. And so the academics were very strong there, but we also had models, role models of, you know, what one could do in academics. And I think we also mm -hmm. challenged each other in a very, very positive way 
uh, intellectually. And so, you know, I, I credit, we're still in touch with some of our teachers and, you know, the band director and many of our classmates and we run into each other all over the world. Uh, and, and so I think that, you know, that uh, like an athletic team, you know, pacing each other and getting better, uh, that happened with us uh, intellectually and academically and you know, in terms of our careers. Wow, great. Yeah. So, Rod, how can Paul challenge you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul's doing such beautiful research as well. So I, I, I think we all, uh, by observing how other people do things, like one, a favorite topic for uh, anyone who's trying to guide and mentor is how do you do it? You know, what are your, how can I try to improve by what other people are doing? how they're interacting with people on their teams and so on. So I think that's a really exciting part. And that, that crosses all disciplines too. Of course, it's fun to talk to fellow scientists, but then we see superb managers in other areas of life and what, what do they do? And so I, I think uh, that Paul has taught me a few things uh, about being a director because he was a director of a very large center at UCLA as we're facing interesting challenges on a daily basis that I might be getting only on a weekly or t- maybe two times per month basis. <laughs> so that those sorts of things are, are very helpful as well. Mm-hmm. Sci- science is still a people oriented activity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And we do keep touch. I'm on the advisory board for Rod Center. And mm-hmm. I, actually, I think one thing that will be interesting uh, for our audience to hear is, how is it that you choose problems? You've consistently, you know, opened up new fields and moved, you know, very, mm-hmm. very quickly uh, ahead in, in those. And then also, how do you manage this, you know, really big effort that an IBS uh, center is? Okay, those are really interesting questions. Right, two, for, <laughs> yeah, two questions. For, for which prob- problems to work on is a lot of fun. And so we... We, we sort of have a process where, let's say I think of an idea, then uh, it's really up to the other person's uh, dreams and enthusiasm and drive. You know, might they like my idea? So we might start talking about scenarios like, uh, does it violate the laws of physics? Can we, can we do some analysis to try to box this thing in a bit? And then and then we, we need to talk, is this something we really might want to do? Because if we do this, we're not doing other things. And if you do that, you know, if you go do this, uh, you can't go in the lab and do some of the other things you, you might have wanted to do and so on. So it's very dynamic. Um, if I could do everything myself, uh, then it would be a different thing. But then it would be missing all the fun of the dialogue uh, with people. So how the ideas come... Um, that's something that would be fun to hear everyone else explain where their ideas come from. They're kind of come like a spark. Uh, now, you know, those of us who have read, uh, book Blink, right. And, uh, talk about how much of our subconscious mind is contributing to that spark that might happen that I, I don't really know all of that. You know, I think uh, Tesla thought it came from outer space, which might well have been the case uh, for him. And then for others, it might be we're thinking really hard about certain things, and then we kind of forget about it for a while, but our subconscious doesn't. It's still churning away, and then we're in the shower or something, and then, bam, we think it's a flash, but maybe it's been going on in the background for a long time. Now, uh, in terms of directing the center, um, really try to uh, explain that I'm mostly scientists. So there have been some interesting uh, sort of fun challenges to try to make the right sort of decisions to, because, you know, as a new center and a new institute, that oversees the centers, we don't know how to do everything. And the Max Planck Institute was the same. When they first started, they were kind of making it up as they went along. And then they found what works over a hundred years and things are fairly well defined. But for us, they haven't been. So sometimes we need to sit down, I and my 
group leaders and kind of say, geez, oh, what should we do that is really sensible that if we make this decision and mm -hmm. set a precedent, then everyone will be doing well with it for years into the future, or we need to adjust again. So I think those are those could be interesting, but I just to make a little humor, a little joke, Paul, uh, I did meet with my staff once four or five years ago and explain that, you know, if this is 100% administrative burden and this is 100% science, let's try to keep moving my needle from this side over to this side. <laughs> but I know it. I know it's not going to get to 100% science. I understand that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have a following question for this. Oh. And, uh, you'll be, uh, you know, the leaders in the new uh, institutions and even in a new country, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You must have met a lot of problem for the culture difference from Western to Eastern. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so how you handle that when you discuss with the people, so even in science for new ideas or even for the management? There uh, must be some stories. Yeah, that's, oh, there's <laughs> lots of fun stories, uh, Alice, and uh, there are real uh, fun uh, issues that come when culture, when cultures mix and we're trying to find ways to do science and actually can be very valuable. People who come with different perspectives at how they solve problems or how they think can really lead to a broader scientific opportunities and, and, and so on. But, you know, in, as an example in Korea, uh, Korea has been called by some foreigners who have lived for very long periods in Korea, like a British journalist who wrote a book about the Koreans who lived in Seoul for about 40 years said, when you think of Korea, try to think of a mix between as long as people are in an informal setting, uh, Ireland and Southern Italy. <laughs> now that's in, in informal settings, you know. So my first visit to Korea, I was a visiting professor at Sungyeonggwan University and Everything was, was seemed at times quite formal with vice presidents and things like that. But then we went out to lunch with the chemistry faculty and right in the middle of lunch, uh, a first year assistant professor leaned across the table and tapped me in the chest after I had said something and said, Rod, you don't want to do that. That's ridiculous. You know, that's really stupid. What do you want to do that for? But then if the, it, in a different environment, he would have been you know, very serious and quiet. So, and she is yeah, Right. Exactly. <laughs> so when it comes to science, uh, it's a lot of fun because we have people from different backgrounds and some people, uh, you know, I won't mention different ethnic groups, but some people don't say much, but they're thinking deeply. Other people very talkative. And uh, in Korea, uh, you know, there's the Confucian aspect. So what I try to have everyone agreeing to is when we go into the room where we talk science, then we do science. And we're all the same and we want to ask lots of questions and so on. Now, if you step outside that room and you see the vice president, perfectly natural. That's part of the culture. So I think it's very helpful to remember, okay, now we're, we're in the science mode. And now yes. we're in our, now well, we're in, now science we're in our, universe. Yeah, science <laughs> universe, right. And now we're and now we're in our, our culture. So we should do what we feel comfortable with in our culture, respect other people's cultures and yeah. So, Thank so you, Rob. Actually, yeah, Rod, what you're saying is that when you're discussing science, you don't look at the hierarchy and then what titles you have. We are all scientists and we're really discussing really science, but of course once if you get out of that mode and then of course you really respect the hierarchy sort of thing. Yeah, that's right. And so uh, we need to ensure that how to have people feeling comfortable. So I will tell my students and postdocs, you can call me Rod if you like, but you can call me this if you want to call me Professor Ruff. That's what you're most comfortable with. So I've had some, you know, students from different countries continue one or the other, or they continue for a while and then switch to Rod. So that's interesting when that happens. Or <laughs> Or they start right away, oh, you just released me, you know, you're Rod. And so uh, so that's, I think, very, very useful. Yeah, when I in Japan, yeah, some things, 
actually. Uh, my professor sometimes I call the uh Taco or sometimes I call for the call him uh, Professor Somias. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> yeah. So I think people feel comfortable as long as we're getting generating good questions and people don't feel uh hesitant about asking questions and being participants then it's okay each person has then their own style hmm. okay i think uh, we are coming to the end of our program and maybe i'll ask the last question and then i heard that uh, both you and paul are, uh, have been a troublemakers when you were in high school is it true <laughs> i know it's true for paul i was a very good boy <laughs> <laughs> so, so most interestingly that you know when you're curious I mean, you get this honest, false information yeah. me? <laughs> <laughs> on that note and then uh, so thank you again Rod for a wonderful talk and also I want to sincerely thank all our panelists for uh, their uh, very thoughtful questions and participating in this panel uh, discussion and then with that and then uh, we have, let me go and then see somehow my... Yes, I think now you share okay, the screen. Good. Yeah. So then, of course, uh, tomorrow we are going to have uh, uh, the uh, ES, ES Nano Rising Stars program and uh, next week and next Friday. And uh, it will be chaired by Paul. And uh, so really, ES, ES Nano is uh, Paul, Paul, Professor Paul Weiss is the editor-in-chief and then he really created wonderful programs and it's really great to see so many young people have been recognized and with this uh, program and which makes a big difference in their case. And then having bright stars really giving the talks is fantastic as well. Hopefully you'll join us on uh, next Friday. And uh, so we really appreciate uh, and then look forward to seeing you and then listening to these uh, future stars or the future leaders of the science, which they're doing so. With that, and I think uh, every Friday again, we'll see you at 8 p.m. and. Uh, uh, Beijing time, and uh, so listening to some wonderful scientists as we have uh, heard from Rod Roth today. And uh, so thank you, Rod, again for your uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, so have a good evening, and uh, thank you all, and then enjoy your evening. My Bye -bye. great pleasure. Thank you Bye -bye. very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.